So today is exam three already. You know, um, there's a lot of cardiac, a lot of respiratory, a lot of definitions. So that's my heads up to you. Um, make sure that you do look at those definitions and understand cardiac and respiratory and what those things mean and what to look for. So uh, I think this PowerPoint is very well done. Um, actually, it was one that came in for my predecessor and I went try to change it and I wouldn't change a thing. I mean, maybe I'd change a color, but it really didn't need much more than that. There are a lot of chapters, 25 through 32. So six, seven, eight, nine, 31, two, a lot of them. But remember, don't be overwhelmed. You've got the concepts on this um, PowerPoint on your study guide, and then go back to your PowerPoints given weekly um, and see where those were that are there. Or maybe go back to the lecture. Like, I didn't understand that. What did that mean? Go back and listen to it again, okay? <clears throat> so let's start out with respiratory. I mean, what's the most important thing in the world, right? If you can't breathe, you don't have oxygen, nothing else matters because you're dead, right? Always airway first. So let's talk about airway. Well, what is ventilation? Well, it's breathing, air in, air out, simple, okay? Now, how do you get oxygen around to your body? Well, oxygen goes around your body by the red blood cells. Red blood cells are also called erythrocytes. So if you wanna know what carries oxygen, it's the erythrocytes. And that's usually the word that they will use, erythrocytes. Now, what is a good oxygen level that you should uh, strive for? Most children, except for some cardiacs, we're not going to go into that, but every child should have an oxygen saturation greater than 90%. Because if you are not at 90%, are you giving your brain the oxygen it needs? Are you giving the organs the oxygen it needs to be able to work well? So, if we are concerned about uh, a child, number one, we need to know what respiratory distress is. Tachypnea is your breathing fast. So if the high normal is 30, it's more than 30. You know, a one-year-old should maybe breathe, the respiration's 20 to 30. Well, if it's 40 or 50, they're tachypnic. They have, they have tachypnea, okay? Their lungs will sound wet and they'll be wheezing. Rails, ronchi, wheezing. You're going to see those accessory muscles, uh, abdominal breathing, intercostal retractions. And you're going to see those nail beds turn a little bit blue or cyanotic. Now, because the oxygen level isn't high enough, you also are probably going to be seeing some confusion, irritability, because you don't have oxygen, you can't think right. Okay, and that's part of it. And also when we're talking about um, children with respiratory distress, what we say is strider, which means there's a noise. Usually it's inspiratory strider, especially like you hear in croup. It's like this, like the air doesn't go in well. There's a noise, something's blocking it. So strider, it's that sound or difficulty inhaling or exhaling. Now, what is a name for, uh, another name for a common cold? A common cold is coryza, right? Now, coryza is all of that fever, cough, mucus, um, and, and spitting up mucus and, you know, nasal secretions. Now, allergies are different. With allergies, there's no fever. You're sneezy and you're itchy. And it's like a runny nose. It's a different sort of mucus that comes out. Now, when you are forming inside the body, the baby has lungs that are getting ready to come outside into the world. And they have something that holds the lungs open and they don't collapse. Because in fetal circulation, they don't have to breathe. There's no air. They don't have to keep open. There's liquid and stuff in there. So there's something called surfactant and it holds those alveoli open and that keeps them open so you exchange oxygen and carbon dioxide. And that's the purpose of it. 
you know, little premature babies, we give actually surfactant liquid down their endotracheal tubes and turn them side to side to get it in their lungs. So it's synthetic, but it's just like what our body would produce, surfactant, very important, that keeps those lungs from collapsing. Now, what if a little area of the lung does collapse? Whether it doesn't have surfactant or maybe it had pneumonia or something, well, atelectasis means that those lungs have collapsed, there's accumulation of fluid, and now we've got to do vigorous respiratory therapy to open up those lungs and get rid of that mucus and have that surfactant work and open them up again. So let's keep going here. <clears throat> Some common illnesses in the pediatric patient are, well, one of the things that we hear about is RSV. Now, RSV is common cold for you and me, but for an infant, it's a lot of mucus in the nasal airway and in the oral airway, and it's hard to suck, swallow, and breathe. It is a virus, okay? Um, and it's a low-grade fever that comes with it. They feel miserable, and it's feeding them. That's the hard thing. So RSV, most important pathogen that causes viral pneumonia in infants, okay? Now, asthma. I think we know what asthma is. All of a sudden, you can't breathe, and you have this expiratory wheezing, and many kids carry around those little inhalers to try to, those rescues to breathe. Well, asthma is the single leading cause of ER visits, um, uh, absenteeism in school from asthma and hospitalizations. I mean, these children, if we can't control it, they can't breathe without an airway, you know, they're not going to live. So um, it causes lots of absenteeisms in school and a lot of visits to the doctors, ERs, and to the hospital. Now, cystic fibrosis is a condition that affects two different organs. Number one, the lungs, it fills up with mucus. So now we have to work with getting all those thick secretions out of the lungs so we can breathe. That's the one thing. Number two, it involves the enzymes that are used for digestion so that nutrition can be used in the body. So what do you see with this? Well, number one, we diagnose this through a sweat test. And it, what it does, it just measures salt on the skin. So you can see there is a loss of electrolytes in their sweat. This is sodium. I mean, if you had a child yourself, I'm not saying to lick another kid, but if the child was yours, had cystic fibrosis, and you licked them, you would taste salt. So it's that electrolyte imbalance you see. Another thing that happens with cystic fibrosis is they're not digesting their food, especially fat. So you have the most foul, nasty smelling stools you've ever smelled in your life. And they're frothy, almost like you, you spent them up and phoned them up in a mixer. That's how frothy they look, okay? Now, laryngotracheal bronchitis is another word for croup. Ever hear a kid barking really loud? Well, that is croup. Remember, croup, you have strider. It's inspiratory strider. It's that upper airway swollen. They can't get air in, and you're going to hear them making that sound. Now, if you let this laryngotracheal bronchitis or croup go on because of where it's located, it can swell the epiglottis. Now, remember the epiglottis covers the trachea when we swallow, so it prevents food from going in the lungs. But when it swells, it covers the trachea. Therefore, you can't breathe. This is a life-threatening emergency. These children need treatment immediately to decrease the swelling of the epiglottis and let that child breathe. Okay, here's a bunch of little words and key terms and cardiac review. Tachycardia, tachy is high. So tachypnea is breathing or tach tachycardia is an elevated heart rate. Bradycardia is when it's slow. And remember, slow depends on the age of the child. 
slow for an infant would be less than 100. But uh, about 100, you're almost tachypnic, tachycardic in an adult. So just remember those things as you're looking at those as you become nurses. This means something abnormal, dyspnea which means uh, difficulty or abnormal or hard to breathe, okay? Hypo, well, we heard of hypo as less than, right? Like hypothyroid, you have not enough of something. Well, hypoplastic means one of those ventricles is way too small. And it's usually the left ventricle that is really, really small. It's called a hypoplastic left ventricle. The ventricle is small. There's also shunting. We can see shunting usually comes from the left atrium and there's that little hole that's left there after birth called the patent foramenal valley. And sometimes that flow pushes um, blood back into the right side, that's a shunt. So something irregular that shouldn't be that blood flowing from one place to another is a shunt. Now a murmur, is something that a valve is just not closing right. There's something, it could be a uh, hole between the atriums, the ventricles. And when you hear a murmur, you'll never forget it. It's almost like a <laughs> at some times, or sometimes there's clicks <laughs> instead of <laughs> there's different sounds that you normally hear. So that's a murmur, like they're whispering like what they shouldn't whisper. Now, cyanotic is when you don't have enough oxygen. So you'll see some bluish discolorations, could be in the fingers, could be around the lips, or even around the eyes, you can see them. We see cyanotic sometimes in our heart um, problems where we're not getting oxygen around. Like that hypoplastic, like I said, that left ventricle is not working, that's a cyanotic heart defect just like a tetralogy of Fallot when they have those tet spells, that's cyanotic, okay? Now, an acyanotic is when blood flows good, oxygen is good, there might be some mixing of something, bloods, but it's okay. You see these with holes between the atrium and the ventricles. There are the ASDs or VSDs, atrial septal defect, ventricular septal defect, they're acyanotic there's still blood going to the lungs and still going to the body. And then stroke volume is the amount of blood pumped out with one contraction. Now that left ventricle is your engine of the heart, right? And it pumps and one pump is called stroke volume. Now I sort of mentioned a little bit about an ASD. This is in between the right and the left upper chambers called the atrium, there is a hole. The thing that happens with atrial septal defects or even ventricular septal defects is blood comes back from the heart into the left atrium. It's oxygenated, but you know, there's this hole there and blood will flow back into the right side. It's just the way that the pressure goes. It goes back to the right. And what happens, it goes back up into the lungs. So it increases blood flow back to the lungs, okay? So, Whenever we have blood flow going from one place to the other, it's where is the least resistance. Now, think about a drop of blood. We know that it goes through the body and it just comes back to the right side and gets in there, right? So it's really little pressure. Now that left side, you've got these, the lungs are now pumping. It's actually four pulmonary veins to tell you the truth. I was shocked when I learned that when I worked in the cardiac unit and it pushes blood into the left atrium. So where is the great flow? Flowing into left atrium, it's a high flow. So it's gonna go to that right side and that's why it goes there. So what do we do? Well, if it's big enough, they're either gonna do surgery to close it or they do some really neat repairs in the cardiac cath today that don't require any open chest surgeries and it works really well. Ventricular septal defect, same thing. 
is going to be that hole between the two bottom ventricles and it's going to flow from the left to the right. Well, just think what the left ventricle does, right? It's gonna pump hard, that stroke volume. It's gonna push blood back into the right side, back into the lungs. Again, there is more blood flow in the uh, lungs because of that, okay? Again, most of the time we'll do surgery depending on the size, but there are some calf closures that we're still able to do and they're still figuring out how to do it. I mean, I want to tell you, cardiac surgery has gone leaps and bounds since the first child I saw with a cardiac disease back in the 80s until when I left the unit back in the early 2000s. It was amazing, the advances and how medicine changes. So if you ever want to work in the cardiac unit, it's a lot of fun, a lot of energy, a lot of adrenaline junkie people there, me. Okay, you've heard about uh, fetal circulation, and you know there's something that connects the lungs to the aorta called a patent ductus arteriosus. It is needed for the fetus. It's part of the way that fetal blood flow flows. But after birth, mom stops producing the hormone called prostaglandins. And if it doesn't have the prostaglandins, that little connection, PDA, just closes up by itself. Sometimes, though, it doesn't close for whatever reason. Now, most of the time, they can just give a medicine, and it's called endomethacin. Now, believe it or not, endomethacin is like ibuprofen. It is an NSAID. And we give it IV and we give up to three doses and we might repeat it two times. And you can actually hear the blood pressure changing. The bottom number is really wide when it starts. And as that PDA closes, the number comes back to almost to the normal place. For instance, a newborn is born with a blood pressure of 60 over 40 normally. If you have a patent ductus arteriosus open and wide, it could be 60 over 18. As that PDA closes, you're gonna see that diastolic number come up and go back to 60 over 40. It is quite remarkable to watch it. Now, one of the things that can happen, and it's actually harder to diagnose, is it, sometimes it passes um, out, and these children get home, newborn children get home without it diagnosed. And what it is, is called a coarctation of the aorta. Think about the aorta coming off the heart, off the left ventricle, and it goes down to the body and there's a kink. And think of a garden hose. If it's kinked, you'll have a little bit of flood go blood going down to the lower extremities, but it's going to be restricted. So what are you gonna see? Well, if you kink a hose, the upper part, you're going to see if there's holes in the hose, you're going to see squirts all over because the pressure's higher, right? Blood pressures are going to be higher. Now, the lower extremities, what you will see usually and what will usually diagnose this is that there's minimal or no pedal pulses at all. And that's usually what we will see at birth. Now, if the kid gets home, because of this hose, it's kinked and the blood has to go backwards and it fills up the lungs. It goes back to the left side of the heart. The lungs get filled up. You're going to see congestive heart failure. And that kid's going to be, you know, breathing difficulty and wet lungs, et cetera. So how do we diagnose this? Well, of course, we're going to do the echo, the ultrasound. And what we can do is what we call an aortogram. And the aorta gram, they fill it up with an opaque dye. And they're going to see if the aorta is, you know, the way it should be or if there's a kink in it. How do we repair it? Well, there's two ways. If it's a minimal kink, we can go in there with the cardiac calf and do a balloon and we'll squeeze it open and it works. Or they need to go in and do surgery. And that's usually with the side the thoracotomy cut, not the open chest from the top. And they go in and put a staple in it. And literally, that's how they close it. Now I mentioned Tetralogy of Fallot, or I've mentioned the kid that has the tet spells. This is a cyanotic heart disease, most common of all of them. And there's four different specific things you see with Tetralogy of Fallot. Well, you're gonna have a hole between the ventricles. 
And the TET spells come because blood can't get to the lungs because something's going wrong with that pulmonary valve. It's either small or something covers it and blood flow can't go over. And because of that ASD, that aorta sort of over, should be here and it pushes itself over. And because sometimes blood can't go up into the lungs, that ventricle on the right side gets a little stretched and the muscle gets a little bit of weak. This requires surgery, sometimes at birth, sometimes later, it all depends. Now, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, most severe of all the cyanotic heart defects. Look at the size of that left ventricle. It's really non-existent, okay? And it's really hard to get blood to flow around in there. You know, your aorta is small, the ventricle's not pumping. I mean, blood just sits there. So we've got to do a bunch of crazy stuff to open different places to get the oxygen flowing um, and get it up to an O2 saturation of 90%. Because these children at birth are between 65 and 75%. And we can't increase that due to many different reasons. So these children at birth, they're going to put something in there called a Norwood or a Blaylock toxin shunt, and that acts like a PDA, but then they grow out of it. Then they go into the Glen and do the Fontan. Um, I've worked with a lot of these kids. These kids do well, um, but many of these kids, because of the multiple surgeries, they end up with transplants, but they're waiting till they're eight or 10 or 12 years old. Um, their hearts last, you know, uh, with good, good care. But this is a really severe um, hypoplastic left heart, severe cyanotic uh, disease. Okay, more cardiac. So the aorta graph, as I said, is that when we look at the aorta, we put opaque material in it. We're going to look to see if the aorta is open or if it's kinked. The echocardiogram is like an ultrasound. And what you can see is murmurs and see if it's structurally okay. You know that if we do an echocardiogram and we see something abnormal, that kid will go for a cardiac cath to look at it closer. Now, I was talking about that coarctation and how the lungs fill up with fluid, right? So I said they could go into congestive heart failure. Well, what do you see? Well, what happens is, is that sudden weight gain. Like we weigh our children every day in the hospital. We weigh them every time they walk into the doctor's office, urgent care or ER. It's just part of pediatric care, height and weight for many reasons. And one of those things that we could see is that sudden weight gain. But remember that lungs are full of fluid, congestive heart failure, full of fluid. They are short of breath, their heart's working hard, you know, and you know, they're just exhausted, these children. Now, sometimes we have children that can have heart um, damage due to an infection. Now, one of the things that can happen is in serious complication to strep throat. So these children will receive penicillin. Now there is strep throat and glomerular nephritis. Both are those big diseases that strep throat that has not been properly treated or not treated. Maybe the parent thought it was, you know, like the last time, viral. And why did I go to the doctor, waste my time? Then didn't go this time and now they have strep throat. Now, not only can strep throat cause these diseases, which rheumatic fever is caused as an inflammation of the heart, cause carditis, and it can have heart valve damage, um, but glomerular nephritis, which can damage those kidneys, but it can also cause pneumonia. That strep and that infection go into the lungs, can go into the meninges and also that extra mucus and stuff that's formed goes up into the ears causing otitis media. So all of those complications can occur from a simple little sore throat that we didn't tell our parents to take all, tell their child to take every single dose of the medicine. Very important. All right, now let's talk about a little bit about blood disorders. So anemia. What is anemia? 
Well, anemia is when there's not enough red blood cells or erythrocytes, right? Well, erythrocytes do what? They carry oxygen. So if you don't have oxygen, you are gonna be this tired child. And that's usually the being tired, being weak, um, being pale is why they come into the doctor's office. We can see them having a decreased red blood cells or we could have them not produced as well. Um, or we can say it might be inherited or acquired. Well, when you think of anemia inherited, what do you think of? Sickle cell, right? That's one of them, sickle cell anemia. And sometimes we have blood cells that they're not produced fast enough or they are being destroyed very, very quickly. quickly. So it's hyperproliferation and hyperproliferation of these cells. The cells are gone. So iron deficient anemia is because in the diet, the child is not getting enough iron. You know, children are picky. So what do we do for these children? Well, we're going to need to change their diet to increase iron. So what are the things, the foods we can feed them? Liver and leafy green vegetables. I know liver sounds horrible, but you know, there's ways to sneak a lot of things into kids. So um, trying to get them to do that. And if not, they're gonna have to have an iron supplement, uh, which causes a lot of other things. So um, trying to get liver and green leafy vegetables important. Now there's one hereditary, hereditary blood disorder um, and the blood doesn't clot, which means you get a cut and they bleed, or you bruise under the skin and it keeps bleeding under the skin. It's called hemophilia. Now, there's another uh, hereditary blood disorder. Actually, it's from descendants of the Mediterranean Sea. So it's sort of like on the other side of the world, but there are children with it here because of descendants. And it's called thalassemia. And thalassemia, they're actually, they're like a rectangular, bigger cell, and they burst quick. They're body produced, but they're gone quick. They're gone. So you don't have hemoglobin there. There are a couple different types of thalassemia. They're described as uh, major and minor. Uh, major is called Cooley's anemia. Um, and it just has to do that the Cooley's anemia, the body um, is killing cells producing them like crazy, but killing them quicker. They're destroyed quicker, and they're going to require blood transfusions to stay alive. Now, what is the hereditary blood disorder where RBCs change their shape to resemble a crescent? Well, when you think of a crescent, think of a sickle cell anemia. Now, what happens with sickle cell anemia? All of a sudden, the blood is maybe dehydrated, which children do all the time for many reasons. The vessels are smaller and they split and go to two places and that cell gets caught at that, what we call that bifurcation and all the cells back up behind it. And it causes swelling, it causes pain, um, and it causes a lot of problems. So sickle cell anemia, what do we do? Well, we need to dilate those vessels we need to get them some fluids. And of course, they're going to be in pain. Pain does hurt. So they're given, usually young children are given morphine and given it very safely. And again, sickle cells uh, also, they die pretty quickly. They have actually lower hemoglobins also. Hyperlipidemia is the excess of fat and fat-like substances in the blood. Okay, do not confuse that with hypercholesterolemia. Lipidemia is the excess of fat. Okay, now let's look at GI and GU. Now, GI and GU has a lot of different diseases that you do not see in the adult world. Um, we know that anything to do with GI, GU has to do with a lot of electrolytes, diarrhea, vomiting, all of those things can cause severe uh, problems with electrolytes. Uh, maybe you're just not absorbing 
you know, what you need, or maybe you are, you know, um, you have an absorption problem, metabolic problem, inflammatory problem. All of those things causes a problem with fluid balance and electrolyte imbalance in children. Now y'all just did a great case study, a discussion question on projectile vomiting in children called pyloric stenosis. Now, can you imagine having a baby three weeks to three months old, a brand new baby and the mother comes in and the kid's vomiting, and I'm telling you, they can vomit and it projectiles across the room. I'm talking 10 feet in the air. I'm not talking a dribble. And with those children, um, they come in saying they're vomiting. I say, describe it. Is it a dribble or are they across the room? And if they say across the room, um, we know it's gonna be a pyloric stenosis and it's easily repaired. Um, number one, we don't want them to eat any more to vomit and get an IV in them to prevent dehydration. <coughs> now, Meckel's diverticulum is some sort of little bulge or outpatching that goes inside the small intestines. And actually what happens is there is a tear that occurs in the intestinal tract. And actually the symptom that you see is painless rectal bleeding. And it causes some distenderness around the umbilicus, but it's mostly that bleeding in the stool or through the rectum that brings the parents in. It requires surgery. You got to go in there and get that diverticulum out of there. And the kids do well when they're done. Appendix. This is still the McBurney's point. This is still right lower quadrant. These children, um, as soon as they're having the pain, they need to get in and have surgery before it ruptures. You know, once the pain is gone, it's ruptured. So once it ruptures, that cecum, that area with the appendix, spews toxic waste into the peritoneal cavity and it causes peritonitis. And it's very serious. It's a lot of infection that goes in there. And these children will require IV antibiotics and fluids and NG tube. And it's a long recovery from them. Now, Hirschsprung's is the lower descending colon called a megacolon or a ganglionic megacolon. It swells and there's no nerves. So you don't have any squeezing, no peristalsis and the stool or the contents, the mucus, um, even saliva, all the juices that are being secreted in the GI tract form and it gets big. You might see a tiny little bit of ribbon stool come out of there, but um, this child needs a way to get rid of the contents of the intestines and they need it pretty quickly. So what they do is they're gonna go in and remove that portion of the bowel that has no nerves in it. And for that, they always put a temporary colostomy. I mean, nine out of 10 times, they just go ahead and do a colostomy. And then later on, usually before a year old, sometimes a lot earlier, they close it back up. So these parents need to be uh, told that this kid will have a colostomy for a little while. Celiac disease has to do with an autoimmune problem of the small intestines where the body reacts to things with gluten. So we don't want any oat, wheat, rye, or barley flours at all. They can have rice, they can have dairy, they can have um, ice cream, they can have meats, uh, fruits, vegetables, but it's the flour. Don't let them have the flour because it causes severe pain um, and it's a lot of problems with malabsorptions because they're not gonna be able to absorb anything from that. One of the things, you know, working in the ER, like I did for many, many, many years, you see children coming into the ER where they got into their medicines and they like to take actually two different things they like. One of them is acetaminophen and the other one is their vitamins. Actually, vitamins are okay because vitamins you don't need, you'll just excrete. But acetaminophen is extremely toxic and it can take and destroy your liver. 
that child will be admitted to the ICU and watched for liver failure. It is a very serious um, overdose for children. So acetaminophen, Tylenol, severe toxicity. As I said before, acute glomerular nephritis is one of those things for that strep infection. Glomerular nephritis, when the kidney doesn't you know, like something and it's inflamed and it's upset, you are going to see these children start to gain on to their fluid. You start to see them become anemic because of the way the kidneys produces, you know, uh, um, erythropoietin, which causes red blood cell production, all of this stuff. So you see this anemia, paler, edema, blood pressures are up. But as soon as we treat for that strep infection, all of it will go away. So that's a good thing. Kids can get chronic constipation and we do not, let me explain, do not want to give any laxatives or enemas as a daily or a routine for children. It is recommended to increase fluids in fiber in their diet. Raw fruits and vegetables are excellent and any grains. Mm. You know, GI, we know is mouth to anus, right? So difficulty swallowing is part of that. There are times in some syndromes, children don't swallow well. I can think of two syndromes, Pierre Robin and DeGeorge. Both of them have really hard time swallowing for whatever reason. Um, so it's called dysphagia. As I said, appendix is the right lower quadrant. It's also called McBurney's point. And that's how we push it in, let go. And if they scream, we know that that's the appendicitis. And we know that we'll need to have surgery as soon as possible to prevent any rupture. Now, urinary tract infections are extremely common in little girls, but boys can too. Now, girls, they have this little short open urethra. Um, a lot of times, um, these girls don't uh, wipe properly. They like bubble baths and all of that at the enter of some sort of pathogen into their bladder, causing urinary tract infections. So what do we say? How do we treat this? How do we prevent it? Well, you're going to increase fluid intake. You know, if their kids are peeing all the time, they're washing it out, right? They also say cotton underwear. You know, today, those cute little tight little pant things, they're not actually good for little girls if they're having chronic urinary tract infections. So cotton underwears and um, making sure that they um, increase their intake and output and then making sure when they have to pee, they go get to the bathroom. Go ahead, go, go, go. Boys, we know um, there are some things that can happen with their penis and their testicles. So one of the things that can happen is called a hypospadias. And this is an interesting condition. You know, in the penis, your urethra should come out the end of the penis, right? Well, hypospadias is on the bottom of it somewhere and it comes out there. And this child, they're gonna go before they're one year old. They can't be circumcised because they need that to do the surgery. And they'll go ahead and they'll do a surgical repair and put the penis urethra coming out the tip where it should be before they're even potty trained is what they should do that by. When you go to the pediatrician first visit with a male infant, What's one of the things they do? I mean, yeah, they check the hips, right? But they're also going to check, do they have two testicles? One of the things about cryptoorchidism, we need to uh, examine that child in a warm room. Men who are in the cold, their testicles suck up. If it's warm, they drop. They hang better. So we'll be able to see testicles better, right? Cryptoorchidism could be one or it could be both testicles, but it needs to be watched and it should be repaired. Impentago. You know, my grandson had impentago. My daughter had thought that he scratched a, a bug bite too much. And I looked at that and I said, no, that's impentago because it kept spreading. Now, impentago, there's an opening. There's some sort of scratch. Um, this was on the back of his leg. I've seen it on arms, hands, feet. I've seen it all over the body. 
uh, on children and staff gets in it and you see these bullous regions, uh, lesions all over and they're juicy and scabby. And these things are highly, highly contagious. They'll be on oral antibiotics and they'll be topical antibiotics on that. Ringworm is a fungal infection. So we're going to need to treat it so that we can get rid of it. Pediculosis, well, this is head lice. Again, we're going to have to comb out the hair um, and put medicine on it. There was a good thing about vinegar water for some of these um, parents. It's just an easier, and baking soda. You put it on it, it could come out. Eczema is a really highly, your skin is inflamed, it's itchy, it's hypersensitive, it's hard to seal, to heal. It's genetically hypersensitive skin. And different sort of uh, fungal infections is, you know, the capitis, you know, the, the head with all of the, um, the cradle cap type thing. Corpius, pedis, and cruis, and these are all sort of skin infections that you can have. Sometimes they wear a hat or they wear helmets in football and they spread it from kid to kid. That's where they get a lot of these things. And again, they require medicines and ingested, not just topical. Pediculosis is that lice, but it can be just more and just the hair. Remember the adolescent, it could be underarms, it could be in the pubic area. Scabies, um, I think one of the things about scabies is um, when you're having a, going on, on vacation, it happens a lot, I've seen it, where they're on somebody else's beds and the mattresses and there was scabies and they come home and they have these little red dots all over and they itch. Again, this requires treatment. It requires a lotion, a shampoo, and then repeat it, you know, like a week later to make sure the eggs, et cetera, are gone and burns. You know, children love to touch wires. They love to put their hands up on pots on the stove, all sorts of things they love to do. So the airway is always number one. If it spills and it's anywhere next to the mouth, the head, always check airway number one. They, even if you don't think, or maybe it doesn't look like a blanch to the mouth, don't ever assume it could be in the mouth also. And now let's go to some metabolic. So endocrine, think of diabetes or blood sugars that aren't good or they're too high, the pancreas isn't working good, or thyroid, which has to do with growth in children. So diabetes type one and two. In children, when you find it, it's usually type one, which means that the immune, uh, the pancreas, the islets of Langerhan, they've been destroyed and they, they're never going to produce insulin again. Okay, so it's never going to change. If a kid has been diagnosed type one as a little kid at two or three, and that's usually when we find them, they're going to be type one for life. What do you see? What are those signs and symptoms? Well, think of diabetes, there are three things polyphagia, hungry, hungry, because they're not using sugar in their body and their body's hungry. So they eat, eat, eat. They're also urinating a lot and they're also drinking a lot. And because they can't utilize calories of carbohydrates, they're gonna lose weight. And another thing is when you see these potty trained children urinating at night in their beds called enuresis or nocturia. What do you see when you have a diabetic child who is uh, going through signs of hypoglycemia, or you could call it insulin shock, low blood sugar, basically? Well, these kids, they don't have sugar. They're going to be hungry, absolutely. But they're going to be weak and irritable. Now, if you're not getting sugar and food to the brain, you're going to get confused and you're going to be irritable. You're going to be pale, you're going to be sweating, and you're not going to be able to control yourself. These children with hypoglycemia are usually, if they're coming to an ER, they put them in a, um, either carried by a parent or put in a wheelchair because they can't walk by themselves. So what do you do to intervene with hypoglycemia? 
Well, you, you need to get sugar in them. If they're awake enough to talk to you, you get them something, you know, some apple juice, give them orange juice, give them some milk, give them something, give them a couple sugar tablets, something, get their blood sugar up now. Now let's go into some other metabolic problems. Um, Cushing's has to do with the adrenal gland and has to do with cortisol or it has to do with steroids, okay? Cushing syndromes is a result where there's too much steroids in the body, whether the adrenal gland produced it or if you took some like prednisone by mouth. What you see is um, things like this. You're going to have weight gain, absolute weight gain. You're going to have big round moon cheeks and they're going to be red. So moon faced and what we call ruddy cheeks, big red cheeks. But one of the things that you see is skinny arms and skinny legs. So it's all in the trunk. So you have the big face and you have the big abdomen and chest but your arms and legs will be thin. That's the interesting part of that. Now, diabetes insipidus has nothing to do with blood sugar. Can I say it again? Diabetes insipidus has nothing to do with blood sugar. Now, insipidus has to do with the pituitary gland, okay? And it's two Ps. When you talk about pituitary gland, we're talking about fluid balance in the body, urine output. So insipidus is when you are urinating, urinating, drinking, drinking. And remember, if you're urinating a lot, you're probably getting rid of electrolytes, right? So this would be a child that you would absolutely assess vital signs. You're getting rid of fluids. You could go into shock if they're not drinking enough to replace it, okay? So diabetes mellitus is three Ps. It has the polyphagia, they're eating. Diabetes insipidus, they're not hungry. Their sugar is okay. They're only two. It's polyuria, polydipsia, okay? So vaccines give an acquired immunity. So we take what, influenza vaccines, um, to try to prevent us from getting influenza, COVID, right? That's how we got our immunity. That's an acquired immunity. Again, dysphagia, difficulty swallowing. And then you have a kid who could possibly have hypertension. They're testing it a lot more these days. So what do we do? Well, they number one, they recommend to get this kid more active um, to exercise, but they also put them on a diet really similar to the adult world, which would be low fat, fruits, vegetables, fish, poultry, and low sodium. And these kids usually will respond and do well with that. Now, sometimes we have a problem with red blood cells and we want the body to produce more. We can give erythropoietin. It's what the kidneys do, but if they're damaged, we can give a sub-Q injection of erythropoietin. So you also have some med problems here. You remember you have to do pounds to kilograms and then you have to do milligrams per kilograms. So make sure that you study your math. I've sent everybody some dosage calculation video. I also sent you the three worksheets that go with it. I make it so easy. If you haven't watched it, you should. If you have any problems with the math, does anybody have any questions? I just have one quick question. Sure. So you're saying that the acetaminophen causes toxicity and then the aspirin does too, right? Well, aspirin is a little different. It causes Ray syndrome. Ray's, right. Right. Okay. But acetaminophen is limited toxicity. Okay. Aspirin does a metabolic problem and it creates, creates other world of stuff. But acetaminophen is the toxicity and it's liver toxicity. You could kill your okay. liver. Thank you. I really enjoy your 